Okay, good morning. I hope everybody had a nice holiday weekend. Do something besides studying? No, no, no. Yes? Good. <laughs> I also I took I, I went for a hike on Friday, so that was nice. Me too. Okay, so today um, I managed to not bring my surface thing, so you get to you know, use the chalkboard. Uh, I think I'll just, yeah, uh, thank you for the offer, but I'll, I'll just chalkboard it. Um, and you can take notes. Um, we're going to go over something called generalized active forces, but uh, I wanted to I look through the votes on the homeworks, and um, this was one of the next highest voted problems, so I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about this one. I didn't manage to solve it this morning on the bus ride here, so we'll get we'll get as far as we can. Um, I got most of the way there, but uh, maybe just showing some of the key points here will help you get get to where you get to the final answer, and we can see if we want to take it all the way to the end or not. How many people have tried this problem? Just a few. So only the three people that voted for it have tried it. So 310 is, um, has a lot of similarities to the exam problem, um, the third exam problem, where we are talking about um, pure rolling. And so this is a, uh, a small bearing system. It has sort of a fixed race for the bearing. And then the inner, inner race or the, you would, is this um, cone. And um, there's two, actually four, spherical bearings. Okay, so this thing, as you rotate it, um, it rolls on all four of those spheres. Um, this will have an angular velocity, and each of the spheres will have an angular velocity. And as you roll, um, the spheres are going to travel around this, this thing, too, okay? Because it's going to impart this. So we're imagining a snow slip on all three of those points. And the question is, is that um, if, you, if you don't get the geometry right in this, um, you will have slip. And, and, and the question is basically, well, what, what geometry um, should I have to ensure there's no slip? And there's a few geometric parameters. Um, theta is this half angle of the cone. B are the distance from the center of the cone to the center of the spheres, and all the spheres have a radius of r. And the, and the claim here is that if I um, choose b such um, using this function, I'm always guaranteed to get no slip at, at all those points. All right? So I'm going to turn off the screen and go to the chalkboard. Everybody got understand sort of what this, what's going on here? Anybody doesn't understand? Want to look at it longer? Chris? What, what, what do you call this? What do you call in the center? These? Yeah, so the, the, the crosshairs, that's the center of a spherical ball. And the spherical ball touches surfaces at these three points. So the no slip is associated with those three points. And if, if you, um, so he calls uh, the balls S or A ball S, the outer race R, and then the cone C. And in the text it says that um, when the shaft rotates, rolling takes place at the two contacts between the race R and the sphere S. Right, and those are those two. And then when the, and then, um, When the shaft rotates, I think I started the uh, sentence wrong on the first one. But when the shaft rotates between, uh, or when the shaft rotates between, uh, da da da. I think uh, okay, I'm just getting sense. But anyways, it ends as well as the contact between the sphere and the cone, and that's this one. So these no slip points are going to be those those three points on any given sphere that we investigate. Okay, and the reason you want it is. 
Well, it can potentially minimize wear because you don't want this thing to be slipping as a bearing. All right. So what, what do you think we're going to have to do first? What, thing, what are we interested in? Motion constraints. And those motion constraints involve velocities. So we're going to have to write out velocities to a number of points. Let me just re-sketch this thing. Um, and I should do it symmetric. So these are theta. And um, I'm going to put sort of this ground level, I'll call it the bottom of the race, here. And, um, and then we'll fit a sphere and this point. And then there's the wall of the race there, too. So race R, sphere, S, cone, C. Contact points here. Right? And we only really need to think about one. Uh, there's a parameter B here, this, di this dimension. And um, the center of the sphere, I guess I should lower that, is here. And then there's a radius a little r. So um, we're going to need to think about velocities of these different points. And um, we could think about writing out some velocity expressions. What would be, um, there's a couple of ways to do it, just like the third problem in the exam, but what, what velocity might we be interested in? And let's label these points. I'll call this uh, P. R1, P, R2, and P, C. So the contact point at C, contact one and two contact points at R1. What velocities might we be interested in to form that motion constraint? I want to be clear here, uh, let's say what these are explicitly because PR is fixed in S, right? We have to be distinct about what, what we're calling PR there. So if PR1 and PR2 are fixed in S, Then we can say this, right? You know, I think you were going on to. Did you have another one? Uh, yeah, so velocity of the PC in C. Must also go to zero, and then we'll say that PC is going to be fixed, um, also in S. Okay, so if we can write those expressions, um, we'll, li we'll likely be able to get get where we want to go. And um, I want to point out too the way I started thinking about it was um, this um, is also equivalent to the velocity of PC um, in R minus the velocity of, I'm going to call it PC star and R. And pro maybe I should just pick, let me just pick some new names. Let's call this uh, PC A and PC B. 
and that would have to be zero if these were if p c a is um, is the point fixed in C and PCB the point, point fixed in uh, S, right? So you can also think about that one like so, Chris. No, um, I haven't really imposed that or, or let that happen. Um, we're going to, we'll start with the geometric constraints that are there, the configuration, and, and they are going to be um, what, they, what they are in terms of this drawing. Um, but the velocities, I'm just saying this, but there's two ways you could write it. I could figure out these two velocities and subtract them, or I could figure out this velocity. And I showed you both of those ways in the, uh, in the exam problem three result. So they're equivalent. They'll get you the same answer. That's, that's all, all, all I want to The only reason to write that. And I think when I was doing it this morning, the bus, I was sort of heading down this path instead of the other for some reason, just, just because that's the way I thought about it first. So um, Let's th think about what these, what these expressions might be. Um, we've got right, this has an angular velocity, and this has an angular velocity. I think it's important to think about uh, now maybe what, what these angular velocities might look like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a reference frame defined by this here. Okay, so that's fixed to R. And if I imagine that this cone rotates, it's always going to rotate about Ry. So um, let's write omega of C and R is going to be some um, value. And I think I'll call, um, what do I call that angle? Beta. So I'm going to say it's beta dot um, in the r y direction. Okay, so I'm just going to pick some some arbitrary angle that would relate r to c, and uh, so this is also c y and r y. Okay, <clears throat> so beta is the angle between um, c and r. All right, so we could write that one. Um, do we know anything about the angular velocity of this sphere? Chris? Yeah, so if, um, if, if this is spinning that way, right, this is going to have to be rotating the opposite, essentially the opposite direction. Um, it's not it's not exactly the opposite direction because we've got these three points. It's not just rolling between two two things. Okay? But this particular I think this particular geometry, um, if I make a trough and I put a sphere in it and I let that sphere roll down the trough, what direction is the angular velocity? I should draw my maybe draw my trough more uh, straight. So if my trough is like this, say say this is horizontal level, and I push that ball through the trough, it has contact points, and there's a line that goes through there that's parallel to here, and it's going to always be about that line. So what direction is, is the angular velocity of the sphere going to have to be? Yeah, so we know this is going to have to roll without slip about these two lines. So I think we could go ahead and make an assumption that um, the angular velocity is going to be along that. 
and we'll call that omega of uh, S in R, right? So we know the direction, and we know that this angle is pi over 4, right? Because we just have a sphere. It's going to be at 45 degrees. So then I think you can write out, out that. Omega of S and R is going to be, um, it's going to have two components, right? It's going to have a, um, a, ne a negative Ry component that's going to be, multi whatever the magnitude is, it's going to be multiplied by the sine, right? Is that the sine? Yeah, the sine of uh, pi over 4. Right? And then <clears throat> it's also going to have um, a component that's always pointing in the CX direction as it moves around. Right? It's always going to be pointing towards the center of the cone. So I think then we have a negative CX. And that's going to be something times the cosine pi over 4. So we need to figure out what those are. <clears throat> so I think those are two important observations about the directions of the, um, of the angular velocity. Um, I think we could figure out the um, magnitude, too, of of that angular velocity in S. What, what, what might that be? And I'm going to label a few more points. Call this SO. I'm going to call um, this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Call this O. I think that's all the points that I was using. How might we figure out the magnitude of omega S and R? How do I figure out the magnitude of that, uh, of uh, the angular velocity of this? So there's like a, whatever this distance is, times a beta dot would give us what the tangential velocity of PC is in R. So let's just write that down since we know it. Um, the velocity of PC in R is going to have to be um, whatever that, that distance is. Uh, what do we know here? Um, it's going to be a function of the radius b and theta. Right? The way I figured that out was uh, I often draw, draw a big diagram here. Points fixed in R. Um, this is B. <clears throat> My tried and true method, when the when the geometry looks complicated, is to make a lot of small vectors and add them up. Um, so I should have different color chalk, but uh, maybe I can do it with this. If I think about a vector there, a vector here. Here, 
and a vector there. Maybe I can get get back down to um, where I want to be with the geometry that I have. So let's call that distance A. We don't know it. And we're interested in that component. So I would say, well, what's the R from um, R to PC from O? If I break it up into those vectors, um, then I can say, let's put, put our coordinates back on here. We had R, Y, vertical, R, X. So I can say uh, negative A. R, Y. That'll take me to here. And then here I've got, this is um, going to, the, there's a Y component that's a cosine of theta. So that's going to be plus B cos theta in the R, Y. And then there's a component and that component's going to be in the CY, right? Because it's, it's, this, this whole thing is rotating as, as things spin around. So CY um, sine B. And that's also positive. Uh, B sine theta in the CY. And that, that gets me to here. Right, and then, well, the distance from here to here, um, we know that this is, we've got A, we've got R, and R, and then we know this whole, this thing is um, B cosine theta, right, this, this component. So I think we can get what this distance is, is B cosine theta minus A minus R. Get that? So I'm going to say we're going to go into negative, and this is always going to be pointing down in the RY. I'm going to say it's B cos theta minus A minus R in the RY direction. So that got us to here. And now we got to get back up to here. Um, well, <coughs> theta is going to correspond to one of these. And um, it's this, right? So then I got R, that vertical. I can get the vertical and the, and the horizontal portion. So then we get uh, that last, last little piece is um, negative, and it's going to be um, R cos theta in the um, sorry in the C X direction. It's supposed to be C X, right? All right, and then the vertical component plus um, R sine theta in the R, Y. All right? So <clears throat> if you do that, I think you'll always get to where you, where you want if you do that carefully. You, maybe you can just intuitively see what this expression will end up being um, or with a simpler geometry. But this, this will get you where you want. We can cancel a bunch of things here. And um, so for the R, Ys, I've got a plus A and a plus and a... Uh, I thought that those were supposed to cancel. Yeah. What did I do wrong here? So I said minus the B cos theta minus A minus R. Oh, because it's a plus and that's a minus. <laughs> All right. Zero. That'll go away. It's not zero, but it, it'll go away. And then we have a plus cos theta minus cos theta. It goes away. And then we're left 
this, this, and everything else, right? This is an R here. So now, uh, reduced, it is, um, we've got some CX components and some RY components, so I'll say B sine theta um, minus R cos theta CX. Those are those two terms, and then we've got um, plus R sine theta minus R and the RY. Yeah? All right. <clears throat> so the, um, we were interested, this, this component is the CX component, and that's that, that right there. That's that distance, I'll call it. The yeah. So back to Josh. Um, this then is it's going to have to be that distance d um, times beta dot and in the r y direction. So that gives, this gives us a, one velocity we may be interested in. We could, um, this is, that's that one actually. Where are we at on time? Hmm. So if we, get, if we just got that one, Maybe we might as well go for that one. Uh, and then we'll have some kind of expression here that may be useful. Questions at this point? Where are we at on this? So what do we need to keep here? I'm going to erase this. this. Let's, let's think about that one. Call this PCB. And remember, well, and I'm going to rename this one PCA since that's how we think about that. Right? I'm going to say fixed in C and one fixed in S. I'm thinking maybe the two-point theorem might help us here. Uh, SO is fixed in S, right? And we're interested in um, this one. So if maybe writing this first, and then and then doing omega cross to R would be useful. So I can write that out. The an SO in R plus Omega S in R crossed R S O with respect to, I'm sorry, P C B with respect to S O. <clears throat> so we got we got something up here. We haven't quite finished that one. This ge geometrical one's probably not gonna be that's not gonna be hard. It's just this R it's this component we already wrote. That last component. And then what's the velocity of SO and R? What should we do now? How, how should maybe how should we get that?
about that? Would that help? No slip tells us that's supposed to be zero. All right, that's the point PR, uh, PR1 fixed in um, S. And then we just need those two components, and we get this one. So we got, looks like we need to figure this out. That's the last piece of the puzzle. We got most of it figured out. What, what, what next? Is there a way to figure out what the magnitude of that angular velocity must be? I think um, I tried to allude to that earlier. Maybe just thinking about a single disk rolling on What's, what's the magnitude of that? If, uh, am I going back and forth here? Oh, if you know. I guess V of S O N R. We have everything, or am I missing something? Missing I think what I did was say that um, this must ma have some magnitude. If I take away the cone and just roll the roll the ball around this this corner, that um, yeah, this relationship to how fast it's going around and um, and what is and its angular velocity because it's rolling and. Uh, I think I, what I, the way I thought about it was to introduce a new coordinate frame. So if I have this disk and I have the ball here, and then there's R, forget what I did, Rx, Rx, Rx crossed into Ry. So we're looking at it from the top. It's going to be Rz. Actually, let's put the ball here to make it easier. Um, Ry is pointing up, so let's just call this phi, phi dot. See where that gets us. So if this ball is rolling around such that we have a new auxiliary reference frame here, I'll call this Ax. A Z, <clears throat> and then we know that omega A X, sorry, omega of A in R equals phi dot R Y. Okay. So then you can figure out another, the velocity of SO in R 
must be the velocity of O, uh, which is zero, um, which is phi dot ry crossed with this distance, which is B in the AX. And that's going to equal B phi dot R, sorry, um, always in the AZ, right? So I think that uh, that's that, right? Write phi dot b a z must equal. Um, let's just put some variables here for now. Call it uh, omega one and omega two. So PR one, right? PR one. So this is R in the negative Y. This crosses this term is zero, and Ry crossed with Cx, Ry crossed with Cx is always going to be in the negative Cz. So this has got to equal. Negative omega two cos pi over four uh, times negative r in the negative c z direction. B and uh, a z, and I think there's a relationship between c z and a z. CZ um, is this other one, beta. Right. CX, CZ. I don't know. This is about where I got on the bus this morning. We're getting somewhere, I think. <laughs> um, I think there's a, one piece of information maybe we haven't pulled in here to, if we had the relationship between beta and phi, um, I think we got all the pieces here to write out. Then we could write out omega S and R. We'd, you know, we can figure out, you could solve for omega 2. Um, I guess it has to do with that... Uh, I mean, phi dot and beta dot have to be opposite of each other, right? They have to be equal and opposite on this no slip thing. Is that the, key? Is that the last piece? Uh, if, I, if I'm rotating the... Now, there's some relationship between the uh, geometry, I guess. If I rotate the cone... It, it, say that again. Yeah, 
and they would la and they lag. So there's a geometric relationship between phi dot and beta dot. And if we can write that out, then I think we got the whole picture. So what do we need to write to do that? Um, it must come from thinking about uh, the velocity here. What's the, what's the relationship? I think it's something, something simple. If that's spinning, it has to do with this distance, right? Right, because if I if I have a velocity here, and I say this is rolling, then that's going to impart an angular velocity to the to this sphere. So I think the relationship must be that. Um, we just not write down that I mean it's, th it's this right so we already have this and we can write out that in terms of um, the variables we have maybe if we write that expression that, that that's the rest of it I'm erase this figure Do we Got enough on the board to remember the geometry. So where was that? PC, oh no, PCB. Didn't we write this one out? Which one did we write out? PCA. There. So we can say that uh, D beta dot ROI. Equal, I mean, minus this RPCB, which was that term, which is what we were working on here, right? Um, RPCB equals this. But we need to plug in, um, we can solve this for, what can we do there? What's, oh, I, keep, I wanted to think, uh, didn't finish that thought on what's the relationship between uh, CZ and AZ have to be pointing in the same direction, no? Is that the key thing there? CZ and AZ have to be pointing in the same direction? Something like that. How many will be fine if we leave that for you to figure out in your homework? The last bit. I mean, there's one more piece here. Uh, and I've given you quite the trail to get there. Uh, I would like to move into new, new material and not, not get hung up too long. Um, it's never predictable how long you're going to spend with the dynamics problem, as you probably know. But uh, there's another key relationship here. If this thing rotates, right, C, um, CZ is out of the board, so it's going like this. And AZ Yeah, it, it's that's not quite. We still got to. We've got to figure out that relationship. So what if we write all this down? What do we get here? We know what this is, and we know what that is, but we can only plug one of them into this equation. So let's let's use that one. B phi dot and Z. Maybe we should just write it all in terms of CZ. 
plus omega cross to r um, cross this term. So that's going to be negative omega 1 sine pi over 4 ry minus omega 2 cos r, I'm sorry, cx crossed with r, we're writing this one right now, so to cb. So that's that one little component there, um, which is going to be r cos theta in the uh, negative cx, right? Plus r sine theta in the positive ry. That minus that has to equal to 0. And then we've got that these two things have to equal to each other. This amounts to four equations, right? I think in the um, in the C frame, and the two unknowns are phi dot and beta dot. So I think that you can. There's only a, a single phi dot and beta dot that make both of those both of these vector equations true. I know what do we got. We got. We don't know omega one, omega two. So we're solving, we're trying to solve for those. So we could find out what omega 1 and omega 2 are in terms of beta dot and phi dot and rewrite these. Is that enough information then to get, to get uh, what do we want? might cancel out, cancel out. And that that is that. You can just plug that in. And then we have no A's. Right? Change that to <clears throat> not quite ready to do that cross product. to be equal to, to zero, right? No, that was the subtraction that equals to zero. Yeah. 
beta dot, omega 2, omega 1, omega 2. There's three. Now it's only a function of beta dot. But we don't know what omega 2 and 1 are. What am I missing? What am I missing? There's some, something here missing. Any thoughts? I did something on the bus. Um, with th this distance here, call that uh, C, is um, this is this is pi over four. So uh, R sine pi four is C. And this has to be that, um, I was thinking that the magnitude of omega s and r has to be equal to um, v over r over c. And that would be something like, um, what value would we use here? Yeah. This one. V phi dot over C. V phi dot, this is um, V over R. Right. Is that true? If that's true, that tells you what omega 1 and omega 2 are. I think that's true. So then, if I plug in omega 1 and omega 2 over there, I have everything in terms of beta dot, whatever, you, whatever angular velocity the cone has. You could solve solve for that, I suppose. Let's leave it here. And you guys work on that la the last bit. I think we're close. I'll do it too. Um, didn't have enough time this morning to get that last bit figured out, but I think I think uh, that's key. And. This expression up here is going to have beta dot in it, but it's going to have you know, Cx, Ry, Cx, and Cz components. I don't know, let's see what that looks like. Was that helpful? Going through? through that detail, but not getting quite to the answer. Maybe that gives you an idea more of how I uh, approach them, approach the problems. Nobody's excited about it. Like, why are you making me do these things? How is, how is this going to help? <laughs> okay. Let's, let's have a five-minute break, and then we'll talk about generalized active forces. And um, in the break, I'll think about what, what we're missing here. Maybe close. Get lost, lost here. All right, it's very close. I think you guys can get it. Um, let me get this board erased.
black ones work way better. Okay. So last time we talked about, we introduced forces and torques, couples and um, forces and moments, and then couples of couples of forces. Sorry, couples and torques of a couple. And I just wanted to write that one equation again to remind us what this means. So this is the moment of set bound vectors S about P. Moment of a set of the bound set of bound vectors S about P. And if you think, if you want to relate that to the moment of the same set of vectors, about, about some other point, then you need this part, right? And this is the, just the vector from Q to P, and that this is the resultant of S. And I'll just put an S there too. Okay, so that set of bound vectors, if I add them all up, I get a resultant. If I can if I know the locations of P and Q, and I know one of one of these two, I can easily calculate the other. That's the gist of that. And then there's a special case, and that special case is when if this moment of a set of bound vectors of S about P happens to be a couple or a torque of a couple. And the definition of a couple is this set such that the resultant equals zero. So if M S of P is a torque of a couple, then um, we basically can write uh, T of S of P, this torque of, of that couple, equals um, the, where do I want to go with that? Every set of S of bound vectors is equivalent to a set S prime consisting of a couple. That there is a, um, I think this I screwed this up last time and now I'm doing it again. If that is a torque of a couple. trying to get at is that um, if you happen to pick a couple that um, suppose a place we have S by a couple and a bound resultant. I don't know what I'm saying here. I still screwed up from last time. I think I'm going to um, 
stop screwing up. And we're just going to skip that for now <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm still lost what I'm trying to tell you about this uh, couple. It's something like the, um, you know, for any uh, set of vectors, I can replace it with a couple and a resultant. And you saw this in Dynamics 101. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm getting mixed up on um, what the, uh, this general version is trying to, trying to tell us. Let's leave it at that. And uh, I'll think about that more carefully. And then we talk about it. So, but this, is, this still holds, right? I can still do this. And if um, oh, <clears throat> the other thing is that yeah, the couple, the torque of a couple is the same about any point. So that's the other key aspect. So if the torque of the couple is the same about any point, then. Um, You can replace a set of vectors with a torque and its resultant. Result, resultant of those set of vectors and a torque about any given point. And the torque is the same moment. Okay? So we don't have to. And the resultant is zero. Right? So this is, if we, were, if we use a couple, we can replace it at any point and the resultant is zero. Thanks, Gong. Okay? That's the, that's the key thing there. It becomes useful um, when you um, have forces applied to somebody, and you may want to know what the resultant is about some other point, and you can use that fact to help translate what it should be. I'll make an example up, and we'll do that later. Okay? So that, so that I think an example would, would clear it up. All right. So... What I want to get in today, something called generalized active forces. All right? Now, recall that we um, talked about how these partial velocities are these contributions to directions of the generalized speeds. And in particular, I, I talked a little bit about how they may relate to forces. So just as a reminder, if I have some generalized speeds, they relate, are related to some velocity vector v. I'm sorry, some partial velocities that are respect, re, respected to um, related to v with respect to each of these three generalized speeds, that um, the resultant, I don't know if that's exactly why I wanted to do my picture. Let's do not high on that one. about if I multiply u1, u2, and u3 by each of these, that I would eventually, I can add them together and get to this point. So there might be a component here, and there might be a vertical component, and then, isn't this equaling out? How did I draw it?
So if we go up some value of 1 and over to and then back some value of 3. So this is u1, v1, and then this is u2, v2, and then this u3, v3. Okay, so they give the components of v. They tell you if I have a unit change in u1, u2, or u3, um, how much v may change. These are the partial velocities. Okay? Now, <coughs> we've just introduced forces. Say I have a multi-leak pendulum that swings in this plane here. And I apply a force F at this point P. The question then is um, what motion does F cause, in particular, how does F affect the use? OK? So if, if I s use some coordinates, QI would be whatever angles I wanted to set the configuration of this. And then we just said that uh, QI equals QI dot, for example. Um, to answer that question, the key are the partial velocities. So the relationship from this F to the U's are going to be through the partial velocities. All right, so let's suppose we have a system in which U1 to Un are the generalized speeds. For a simple non-holonomic system, composed of new particles. with p degrees of freedom in reference frame a. Okay, so this is our sort of generic system. We recall that n is the minimum number of the generalized coordinates. All right, this new is the number of particles. And P, number of degrees of freedom. 
which are n minus m, an m number of motion constraints. If that's the case, then some of the speeds are dependent speeds. And you can write this equation that we've seen. the independent speeds to the dependent speeds. Now, come back over here. going to define the generalized active forces. As such, first, for hol holonomic, we're going to have FR. It's going to be the generalized active force. And we're going to define that as the sum from I equals 1 for all particles of the rth partial velocity of, of that particular particle dotted with the resultant of all forces on that particle. Okay? So this is the arth um, generalized active force holonomic. Right? This is the arth partial velocity of particle I, PI. And then this is the resultant. all forces on P I. Right? Okay, a few things to note. That the Rth generalized active force is a scalar. So we have a dot, dot product between two vectors and we get a scalar. Two contributions from all particles um, affect the Rth generalized active force, except if VR PI is perpendicular to the resultant. And so if those happen to be perpendicular, we get zero contribution. In general, though, they're not. And the third is that FR, right, that R generalized act force, corresponds to UR, the rth generalized speed. So for every generalized speed, we can calculate this generalized active force 
with the dot product of the resultant of all forces on PI times its r partial velocity. And this gives you this relationship between the generalized speeds and the forces applied to the system. So, so back here, right, if I want to know what the r generalized active force is, I can, this basically lets me dot this f into the partial velocities of p, which are all in term, the partial velocities of v are, are, are with respect to each u. And then I can determine these relationships that show me how that force f contributes to each u. That's the key thing here. Okay, those were the holonomic. There's also non-holonomic. Okay. Um, we use F tilde R, the Rth non-holonomic partial velocity, equals the sum from I equals 1 to nu of the rth partial velocity of pi, rth non-holonomic partial velocity of pi, dotted with the resultant on pi. Holonomic and non-holonomic partial velocities are not independent of each other. This relationship here right, relates the independent and dependent speeds. And these are functions of the partial velocities. So you can write a relationship between FR and FR tilde, okay? Um, for example, the velocity of PI equals the sum from R equals 1 to N of VR PI times UR plus VT. That's how we determine these partial velocities. And that also has to equal the non-holonomic version for a given velocity pi. But vr tilde equals VR plus sorry, the sum from S equals P plus 1 to N of VS ASR from R equals 1 to P. 
That's using this relationship, plugging that in. And then, um, we can now use that. So therefore, we can write out fr tilde equals the sum from i equals 1 to mu of vi pi sorry, rth plus the sum s equals p plus 1 to n. dot it with ri. And then you can expand that. Here we have definition of FR over there on the left. And this is an ASR times FR tilde. I think I'm uh, forgetting some tildes here. No. relationship between the non-holonomic partial velocity, I mean the non-holonomic generalized active forces and the holonomic generalized active forces. And this Fs is the so we have Arth, non a holonomic partial velocity is the arth holonomic partial velocity plus this um, forgetting what Vs is. These are the um, in independent associated with the independent speeds, velocity. Forces, non holonomic and holonomic are related through the relationship of the independent and dependent speeds. So I'm going to move into an example for the last bit here so we can just sort of see what all this means.
Okay, the double pendulum is a classic system to look into. It's an interesting system. Um, in particular, it uh, it's a chaotic system. So if we just have two masses, and then this is going to be both of length L, two different masses, and then we have pendulum length L. And sorry, I wanted to find. Yeah. So from the vertical. We define both Q1 and Q2, the angles of those links relative to the vertical. And I'll have a N1, N2 here as the inertial reference frame. And we're going to pick simple generalized. This is going to be in a gravitational field. So each of these particles have a force mg, m1g, and m2g applied to them. Those are the only forces in this case. So we're going to be interested in the velocity of points 1 and 2. And we'd like to calculate the generalized active forces associated with mg, m1g, and m2g applied to those points. So let's write those velocities out. The velocity of p1 and n equals L q dot 1 times c1 n1 plus sine of q1 n. And then using the two-point theorem, we can write this as uh, the velocity of P1 and N plus, if we do the cross product, we'll get L2 Q dot C2 N1 plus S2 N2. Okay, pretty straightforward to get those two velocities. Now, if we have these two used, chosen, we can calculate the partial velocities. So we're going to have V1, P1, is going to be the U1 component, that, so we're going to get L, C1, N1, plus S2, sorry, S1, N2, and then with respect to U2, we get zero for particle two. also has this same component, particle 1, but it will have a now component with respect to U2. Right, so those are all partial velocities. There's no um, remainder components here either. Okay, so we've done this before. We've gotten up to the partial velocities. <clears throat> now we want to figure out the generalized vector forces. We have a holonomic system. There's no motion constraints. 
So we can calculate fr right, equals the sum of the rth partial velocity. And then we're, we're going to have two particles, so i equals 1 to 2 dotted with So we need to know the resultant here. We've calculated the partials, all four partials that we're going to need. So we're going to have two equations. We're going to have, right, and this is going to be, we've got two of these, one to two. So we'll have two generalized active forces associated with the two generalized speeds. We've calculated that. Now we need to know the resultant forces. So if we think about these particles, P1 with mass 1, then M1G, right, we have the force of gravity acting on that. We also have some tension here, T1. at an angle of Q1. And then we also have tension 2 at an angle of Q2. So those are all the forces in that particle. It's being held to the ceiling by P1. It's being pulled down by, P, by P2 by P2. And then gravity is also pulling it down. Three forces there. Particle P2 also has gravity, M2G, and it has T2. And that is an angle of Q2. Those, in our case, are all the forces. And if we sum those up, we can get the resultant for each particle. For particle 1, we're going to have T1, C1, N2 hat, minus S1, N1 hat, minus M1, G, N2. Some of those forces. Uh, and then plus the T2 component. Negative C2, N2 hat, plus F2, N1. And so those are the three forces on the P1. Resultant on particle 2, negative mg into at minus t2 c2 into hat plus s2 n1 hat. So we've got R1 and R2. They are vectors, the sum of all the forces acting on a particular point. And then we can calculate FR. minutes. Okay. We'll do F1 equals the sum from I equals 1 to 2 V1 PI dot it with R1. Okay. 
So that's going to end up being L C1 N1 plus S1 N2 dotted with R1 plus L C1 N1 plus S1 N2 dotted with R2. This is I here. If we do that, T1, C1, if we make take that dot product, we get LC1 minus T1 S1 plus L S1. T1, C1 minus M1 plus M2, G. And reduce this further. So we get a, a scalar here. After taking that dot product, and I'm going to go ahead and just write what F2 ends up being if we do the same thing. It's going to end up being L negative L M2 S2 G. Okay, so you can take those two dot products. Those are two generalized active forces that correspond to the generalized speeds. And show the contribution of gravity to each, related to each generalized speed. Now the key, one key thing to notice here tension terms here. So we wrote the sum of all the forces on each of the particle to get the resultant, but T1 and T2 drop out when you take those dot products. Right? <coughs> this is um, no coincidence, in fact. It, uh, it is a key aspect of formulating um, the, these equations like this, these forces, generalized active forces. It turns out that um, this guarantees that you, you never have to worry about these internal forces between particles. And they're always going to drop out in this dot product. And that's very advantageous because, in fact, I didn't even have to write um, T1 and T2 down in my resultant. I could have only written the effects of M1, M, um, M1G and M2G if I know that uh, a priori.
right. So I think, I think that's, that's all the time I got for today. We'll come back to this. Um, but there's this idea that we're going to get to exploit that we, we will not have to draw free body diagrams of every single point and think about all of the interacting, interacting forces between them. To calculate the contribution of a force to any given generalized speed. All right? So sorry that was a bit of a mess. I'm, uh, Something in